everyone. I'm Brian from the Smart Health Leadership Center at NUS ISS. So together with Burnham and Ling Hui, we'll bring you on a journey today to unravel COVID-19 through a system thinking lens. In the next 15 minutes or so, we'll have, you have a broad introduction to what system thinking is and explore the phenomena that we are seeing and the behaviors that we're seeing in the real world uh, through system thinking, through archetypes, mental models, and the Kinefin cycle. Before we do that, we would like to take some time uh, for all of us to reflect on COVID. How did we manage uh, COVID through the outbreak so far? Who were the people that influenced us and what were some of the programs, infrastructure, or objects that, that actually helped us cope uh, with staying healthy and staying safe? Or which organizations played an active role in, in keeping us safe during this COVID period? Uh, so if I can trouble everyone to take out your phones and set, scan the QR code or go to pollev.com uh, and enter ISS 2020. And from there, uh, put in some of these Right, so what, what did you do in order to cope with COVID-19? Can we do that? Okay, let's see what are some of the responses that are coming in. So I think some of the typical things that, that most of us uh, start to do is to start to wear masks. I see people starting to stay at home, um, having takeaways rather than, than eating out uh, in, in the public, right? Gaming, uh, that's, that's a good one. I, I think that a lot of uh, youth, especially um, because they're unable to interact with their peers, now they, they go on to gaming uh, in order to stay home and stay connected, right? So I think that really helps with uh, mental resilience. Um, family, yeah, sure. Family is also something that really influences our behavior. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a short while. Zoom, yeah. So I think all of us are starting working from home and, and I think that's the, the thing that we really rely on these days. Uh, so see cooking and things like that. Okay, great. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So we know that mask wearing and social distancing does really have, play a, a big role in keeping us safe from COVID. Um, staying home is also something that really keeps us safe. Uh, the behavior of staying home is also influenced by other things, such as you know, if we are monitoring our own temperature regularly, we'll know that, okay, maybe I'm not feeling so well today and I should really stay home. Um, if I am also uh, have a company policy to say that I have to work from home, that also helps me to stay home. Right. If I have a senior that, that's at home, then you know, I might be, that might influence my behavior in terms of social distancing and as well as, as um, perhaps I would like to also stay home uh, rather than exposing my family members, the seniors at home to, to greater risk, right? Um, these behaviors are also impacted by other things, right? So how many community cases do we have out uh, in, in the community is something that if, if there's more cases out there, then for sure there's a higher risk. Um, and how do we mitigate that as, as uh, how to, what the government put in place is to have uh, contact tracing, right? So if contact tracing is done well, then there'll be less community cases in the public and therefore a lower risk. Uh, at the same time, um, there was also trace together and safe entry that's been implemented. Uh, that also helps with the co co contact tracing efforts. Um, temperature screenings out in the public also keep us aware of our, our well-being, right? So company regulations also plays a part. Um, things like mask distribution, having the availability of masks given to everyone, that also promotes uh, mask wearing and therefore also mitigate the risk. If we zoom out a little bit more, then we also see that there are other factors that are out there as well, um, such as MOM advisories uh, to the companies in order for all companies to adhere to similar uh, regulations. Um, and, and then it comes down to opening and closing our borders, right? So if we open our borders, there'll be more people coming in, uh, more people that are uh, perhaps may or may not be adhering to uh, the quarantine or stay home notice. Um, and that will also influence the number of people with COVID uh, in, in the community. And ultimately, we also look at the broad picture in terms of the Singapore economy. Um, you know, the economy will then affect whether if we open our borders or not. So some other uh, cities, for example, in Jakarta, um, the way that the, the balance over here, right, uh, between people's livelihood and the risk of getting COVID, 
Uh, unfortunately, in some cities, they have decided to open the borders and, and start business much earlier uh, just because of people's livelihood is at stake. Uh, and they weigh, weigh that as a greater uh, impact to the population than COVID. So they have to make that choice. So as you can see that um, the risk of I think COVID-19, contracting COVID-19 really sits within a broad system of interacting factors. So when in system thinking, when we talk about systems, we're not talking about IT systems and such, but rather we are referring to a group of uh, interacting uh, entities, right? That each of these things would cascade and, and, and have an effect on one another. Uh, and ultimately this interaction would uh, amount to a certain result. In this case, the result would be um, the risk of, of contracting COVID, right? And uh, in, in a system, you can also look at it at multiple different levels. At a micro level is something that perhaps what we do and influence us directly. The relationship that we have with our family, uh, our choices as individuals, right? If you bring it to the meso level, then you'll look at um, some of the organizational decisions um, that help keep us safe or what is happening within our immediate community. What are the choices that people take? Um, whether to, to avoid or, or to go to, to crowd, crowded places, right? So that's at a macro level. And at a macro level, then we look at, at a nation level, at economy level, you know, what are some of these factors that actually influence uh, the entire system? So what is system thinking? System thinking is a holistic approach for us to analyze a system, uh, all these different interrelated uh, relationships that we see. Uh, in order to appreciate the bigger picture, in order to make better decisions, right? It allows us to look beyond the trees and understand, uh, look at the entire ecosystem of the forest, right? Rather than focusing on just the trees, now we are able to then uh, look into what is this ecosystem and what affects one another. It also allows us to appreciate the complete picture and make more sound decisions. Um, such as if you're, for example, if you are making policies as an organization or if you're making policies for um, the public um, from the ministry level, um, then you might want to appreciate, you know, what are all these different factors? How are they influencing one another before we create a policy that might influence many, many people? Fundamentally, why do we want to do system thinking is so that we can have uh, a better understanding of how the system works. Um, and get some insights as to how it operates and therefore be able to find some leverage uh, and make better decisions. With this, I would like to hand the time over to Punam that would then bring you through uh, more examples of um, COVID-19 and how to look at it from a system thinking perspective. Uh, Bunam, please. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so Brian has given an introduction uh, to system thinking in the context of COVID-19. Uh, so let me, uh, so Brian has given the introduction to systems thinking in the context of uh, COVID-19. Let me go into one aspect of COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Uh, one aspect of COVID-19, uh, which is the wearing of masks. Uh, so in the ideal world, um, Ideally, governments would encourage the wearing of masks, people will wear masks, uh, sorry, people will buy masks and people will then wear the masks. Uh, but in the real world, do you agree that uh, things go as smoothly and as simply as this simple linear flow? Uh, so uh, we'll open up the poll EV uh, and can you go in to just answer yes or no? In the real world, is it so simple, so straightforward? Just, ah, okay. So uh, I think the, wow. <laughs> Do you agree that the real world is so straightforward? Everybody, uh, the, the government says, uh, wear masks. Uh, we can just go out and buy the mask and straight away start wearing masks. And everybody will follow and, buy, and, and everybody will be very obedient and follow and wear masks accordingly. Okay, so uh, the answers coming in shows that the majority feel that the ideal world doesn't work in such a simple manner. So maybe we go to the next slide. 
Okay, as you can see, the majority, um, 60% or so, feel that the real world is not so straightforward. Uh, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the next slide is actually the next poll. So what happened? What do you think happened in the real world? Uh, were there sufficient masks? Uh, were the prices stable? Uh, did people follow the recommendation of the government to wear masks when you're outside? <laughs> we already have one answer, of course not. Uh, okay, so what happened? What were the prices like? Uh, okay now, yes, agreed. Uh, generally okay now. Um, were the price, how were the prices like when uh, this thing initially started? Uh, when COVID-19 started, people wanted to wear masks. Uh, uh, how was the prices? Uh, was it stable? Was it, uh, did, were you able to buy a mask uh, simply? Uh, go to a shop and be able to buy a mask? <laughs> okay, so we have many answers. Uh, some attribute it to Singapore's culture. Uh, there was a need to do some... Uh, quota of masks that were given out free. Uh, the government needed to impose certain penalties to make people comply. Uh, prices increased because the demand uh, came out. And of course, there were mask sellers out to try to do profiteering, etc. Uh, yeah. So, okay, uh, let me move on to the next slide then. Uh, I'll let the PoEV uh, be stopped first. Okay. So, um, Yeah. All right. So why? So we realize now that the real world is not so straightforward. It's not uh, the government says uh, wear masks. You can go out and straight away buy the mask and wear the mask. Uh, so why is the world complex? One of the reasons is that uh, in the real world, when an action happens, uh, there will be reaction. So for example, uh, demand supply gap. When the mask requirement came out, uh, either from our own individual perspective, when COVID-19 started, we felt we should have a need to buy masks. Uh, then there was a demand supply gap, and then the prices were increased. Uh, and then there should be a reaction. Normally, uh, the manufacturer will increase the supply so as to meet the demand, and the prices should come back and stabilize. But the real world is not so straightforward. There will be other impact uh, coming in. Uh, the mask factory capacity, uh, you'll notice there's a two strokes at the action reaction line uh, that indicates a delay yeah i'll explain more in the uh, uh, in the subsequent slides uh, and so overall because of all these various actions and reactions uh, the real world becomes much more complex so i'll go into some of this in the later slides the other reason why the real world is complex is that of human actors in the complex system uh, so uh, I think if I ask you the question, are people easy to understand? Uh, most of you will say no. Uh, are we able to predict their actions easily? Again, all of you will shake your head, right? So uh, this is the, one of the key reasons why complex systems are so difficult to predict, to analyze, to design uh, good interventions for. Uh, but there are tools and techniques to help. So one of the tools and techniques is system archetypes uh, because uh, some of the uh, experts observed the complex world and found that there are some common patterns of behavior in this complex world. Uh, and that, and these uh, common patterns take into account actions and reactions and also take into account common behavior of people. Uh, we wouldn't have time, of course, to go into all these system archetypes, but I'll just give you a flavor of uh, through some examples. So the first system archetype uh, that we'll go into is feedback with delay. So uh, this applies to the price and supply of mass. Uh, basically, what happened of the price uh, in terms of the price increase is similar to a thermometer that is slow to react. So how does a thermometer work? If it works properly, like in this picture, you set the temperature to 19.5 degrees, then a proper, a proper working thermometer may let the temperature go up a little bit to say 20 degrees, and then it will start blowing more cold air, and then the temperature will come down, and maybe it overblows the cold air and it drops to below 19.5 to 19, and then the thermometer will then stop the aircon, uh, the cold air, 
so that it will stabilize back again to 20 degrees. Right? So it will fluctuate a little bit, but not much. But if the thermometer is slow to react, then this is what happens. Uh, when the temperature goes up above 20, the thermometer still doesn't do anything. It goes all the way up to 25. Then the air con starts to blow the cold air. Uh, then when it becomes cold below 19, it still doesn't do anything. It waits for the air con to be very cold at 15. Then it stops the cold air. So this is similar to what is happening for the issue of mass. There was a mass shortage. Prices increase. Normally, the factories will increase capacity, but they are slow to react. Why, why are they slow to react? Because most of them in the uh, initial stages of COVID-19 would have maxed out their capacity already. The only further way to increase capacity was for them to order new machinery. And bringing new machinery in actually takes a long time. All right. And of course, during that delay, the prices increase even further. Increase to such an extent that what happened, I think during the pole EV, some of you mentioned the profiteering took place. People bought the mask and then resold it on car carousel for prices as high as $288 for just one box. Right? Uh, the other aspect, uh, another example of system archetype that can help you analyze the situation is this uh, archetype called escalation. Uh, and the best explanation I can find relating to COVID-19 is from the governor of New York State in the United States, uh, who is quite well recognized as one of the more effective politicians in the U.S. handling the COVID-19 situation. So I'll let him explain uh, what he did. But look at the bizarre situation we wind up in. Every state does its own purchasing. So New York is purchasing, California is purchasing, Illinois is purchasing. We're all trying to buy the same commodity, literally the same exact item. So you have 50 states competing to buy the same item. We all wind up bidding up each other and competing against each other, where you now literally will have a company call you up and say, well, California just outbid you. It's like being on eBay with 50 other states bidding on a ventilator. And you see the bid go up because California bid, Illinois bid, Florida bid, New York bids, California rebids. That's literally what we're doing. I mean, how inefficient. And then FEMA gets involved and FEMA starts bidding. And now FEMA is bidding on top of the 50. So FEMA is driving up the price. <laughs> what sense does this make? So uh, the, all the 50 states of the US are fighting for each other for medical supplies. Uh, in this case, it's talking about the, the ventilator, but it also applies to masks. Uh, and then after the 50 states start bidding with each other, the federal government comes in and also bids against the 50 states. So that is uh, one example of escalation that happened during this COVID-19 period. Uh, the last system archetype I'll give uh, an example of is fixes that fail or fixes that have side effect. So in the complex world, we would prefer that whatever fix we put in will solve the problem once and for all. But unfortunately, most in the practical world, most fixes will have some side effects. And... Um, the fix that we had for COVID-19 in many countries was a lockdown. And lockdown does help, but unfortunately, it does have side effect. And the side effect is a big recession that is happening uh, around the world. And IMF sees it as the worst recession since the Great Depression. All right? So, and there is now even a phrase uh, that is used to describe this fix with a side effect. And it is lives versus livelihood. All right. So system archetypes basically can help you uh, uh, through this taste of these three examples. I hope you can see that system archetypes can help you analyze common patterns and that will help you predict and hopefully avoid issues. All right. uh, the next technique that I will quickly cover is that of mental models, basically the human aspect. And one way to have a shortcut to understand how people behave is to first put yourself in their shoe. What is their group's shared thinking and view? All right. 
So let's look at one situation. When the authorities asked people to wear masks and it made it compulsory, did everyone follow? I think there was one group that did not follow and this little clue will probably give you the answer. I think most of you <laughs> looking at the clown will, uh, the crown will immediately say it's the people who consider themselves sovereign, all right? They do not follow. And if you know the mental model of such people, uh, then in that same news article by the Straits Times, they explain the mental model. The mental model of such people is that they feel that government, authorities, police are all people who should not be governing me. I am a sovereign. I am totally independent. All right. So that is their mental model. And knowing this mental model, you then have to think which uh, measures will be effective for such people. Would more publicity help? More education help? I think you'll know straight away it doesn't help because it is already their attitude. So you probably have to look for some other measures in place. All right. Okay, so uh, yep, I've covered this. Uh, so now I will hand over to Lin Hui, who will uh, go into uh, the Kenefin cycle. Lin Hui. Uh, thank you, Bunam. Okay, hi, uh, I'm Lin Hui, and I'll be taking you through the Kenefin cycle. Okay, so. Uh, what you see over here is uh, essentially the Canaveran cycle, and it's uh, essentially a conceptual framework that is used to help in decision making based on the nature of the problem. Okay, so let's start from the bottom right over here. Okay, so if you explain a problem and you realize that the cause and effect is very, very obvious, okay, then um, then the way the way to solving it is basically to sense and categorize the problem quickly and then respond based on the best practices. Okay, if the relationship between the cause and effect uh, requires some form of analysis or expert uh, knowledge, then these problems are uh, is what is in the complicated space. Okay, and the way that we usually uh, go about dealing with it is to sense and identify what is the scope of the problem before we analyze and then respond to it. Okay. For complex issues, okay, like what Bruna has been explaining, okay, this is where the cause and effect is not uh, obvious at all. It's very, very hard to find out uh, what are they uh, exactly all about. Okay, and usually for this kind of cases is when the relationship can only be perceived once you sit down in high and then reflect upon it in hindsight. Okay, so how we usually go about dealing with this kind of complex issues is that we try to probe, okay, probe around and see what are the patterns and you know uh, uh, scenarios that come out of it before we try to sense where exactly is the real problem that we are trying to address. And then that's where we come up with the uh, response plan and, and deal with it, okay? If relationship between the cause and effect doesn't exist, so um, it is usually what we say that, you know, this problem is uh, chaotic, okay? So then the, the way to deal with it is essentially to act fast, to establish some form of control, okay? Sense what is working or not working and then respond to it accordingly. Okay, so a question for you all to think about, okay, where do you think COVID-19 pandemic would lie within uh, this Canarian cycle? Okay, I would place a uh, COVID-19 pandemic somewhere in between the compl uh, complex and complicated space. Okay, why? Okay, COVID-19 is actually uh, a complicated scenario because it is not a total stranger. We have dealt with, you know, similar uh, viruses in the past like SARS and MERS. So it is, so many countries are more or less ready and all they need to do is to activate uh, their disease outbreak protocols and then to manage the, the spread. Okay, however, it is still complex because of its unprecedented infectivity. Okay, I mean, we have never ever met uh, such a, a virus with such a high infectivity that, you know, it takes a few weeks before you even see a symptom. So, you know, by the time, you know, someone, you know, exhibits a symptom, it, they probably have gone around within that two weeks, you know, probably infecting a lot more people. And that kind of scenario is very hard to predict and manage. So this is where the complexity comes in. Okay, so for this kind of responses, government needs... Uh, to be able to be very agile and then keep on probing, uh, you know, probing what exactly is the uh, scenario like, how has it developed, and then respond to it accordingly. So the approach here, rather than saying that it's a probe, sense, and respond, okay, on most parts, we can follow the complicated uh, quadrant where it's about sense, analyze, and respond. But 
you know, government needs to keep on reassessing the effectiveness by probing around and then have that, you know, um, experimental approach to see what really works and then uh, reevaluate again in time to come and see, you know, if it's something that you should continue or is there a need to change their approach accordingly. Okay, so let's take a look at how some countries have fared so far. Okay, so over here you see uh, this is some charts on uh, the government's response tracker by uh, John Hawkins uh, CSSE. Um, okay, so over here the line represents a seven day rolling average of the number of new cases per day. Okay, and the color that you see over here essentially uh, shows the level of restrictions imposed on the population. So blue being no restriction and red being a total lockdown. Okay, so let me start from the left, okay, with Sweden, okay. Sweden took a very lenient approach in managing the spread of COVID because um, they want to actually cultivate some form of herd immunity, okay. And largely the decision was because uh, at that point in time, uh, the science was saying that, you know, um, COVID-19 isn't very, very lethal. So that is why the government decided to take that approach. But, you know, given time, we realized that, you know, the situation hasn't really worked out for them. And, but the sad thing is that the government has not reacted to the new developments of COVID-19. And we can see how the spread has increased exponentially uh, with, you know, right now close to a thousand new cases per day. Okay. On the other hand, Germany has been doing a fantastic job in uh, curbing the spread. Okay. They actually took a very methodical approach in, um, you know, um, in managing the spread through um, aggressive testing and safe distancing. Okay? A large part of their success story lies in the fact that the government um, you know, really scrutinized the spread while managing the easing of the restrictions with time to come. Okay? And, you know, they, uh, and they did exactly what you know, the Canavarian cycle was actually trying to say, where you know, in this kind of scenario where you know, it's something for the first time and you know, we have that kind of infectivity and you know, it's very, very complex in nature, they, um, you know, they follow the probing process of actually re-evaluating you know, whether something works or not. And then they, they have a very agile approach of you know, saying, okay, this might not work, this might work. Okay, should we continue? Or actually, you know, can we do something better? And essentially, that's what they did. And we can see how you know, the numbers starting... Uh, start to uh, dip down while you know uh, restrictions are being eased at the same time. Okay, so okay we know that you know certain measures work you know such as wearing a mask and uh, doing uh, safe distancing. So but then you know at the end of the day execution is what is what uh, matters right? And we can see that for some very interesting examples like US for example. Um, for the population, you know, a significant number of them has little trust in science and government, which actually makes it very difficult for all the governing states to impose, uh, you know, to tell the population and say, hey, you need to wear masks, you need to stay, you know, uh, one to two meters apart from each other. So because of that, um, you know, implementations of certain policies that the government tries to push down can be heavily uh, affected by all this, what we call non-deterministic factors, you know, such as social norms, you know, um, family structure, or even, you know, fatigue level of the population. So, again, you know, reiterating the point that, you know, when it comes to really um, complex scenarios, you know, um, it is... Um, very important that we take a very probing uh, approach and then keep on re-evaluating what really works and what not and be prepared to, you know, face certain forms of failure and say, you know, hey, this is not really working. You know, it, it's time to take the approach and make the stand as early as possible, especially when we deal with pandemic, when, you know, life, has, uh, life is at stake. Okay, so essentially we've come to the end of our segment. Okay, so essentially what we have done is to give you an introduction of what systems thinking is and to uh, give you a bit of a flavor of what are the, some of the techniques that we cover during our course uh, to you know, analyze what are uh, some of the complex systems out there and then to introduce certain ways to manage these kind of systems. Okay, so a little introduction uh, before we end. Uh, we are from the Smart Health Leadership Center and we are um, established in 2015 with the vision of transforming future experience of health through uh, data, technology, and innovation. Okay, so we do provide uh, you know, a professional diploma in Smart Health Leadership, which comprises of these five different courses over here with 
system thinking uh, covering the complexity in uh, you know, transformational efforts in organizations. So if you have uh, you know, interest in finding out more about how, you know, how to deal with this kind of, of systems, especially even within your organization itself, you know, do consider signing up for our courses. All right. Okay, so with that, uh, we thank you for your time. And now we invite uh, Bunam and Brian back up on stage uh, to answer any of the questions you might have. So uh, in the meantime, please uh, feel free to uh, add any questions and we'll be ready to answer them. Okay. Okay, uh, while waiting for the questions to come in, um, maybe we can uh, explain a little bit more about Smart Health. Uh, so Smart Health is an uh, application of uh, digital assets uh, as well as the uh, related disciplines such as design thinking, uh, business process reengineering, uh, and so on, uh, analytics, etc., uh, to enable uh, more effective uh, health uh, system, all right? And health system, by health system, we are talking about not just the acute health uh, um, care, uh, which is things like hospitalization and all that, but also uh, the well-being, overall well-being uh, of uh, the citizens uh, and residents of uh, Singapore. So uh, it will cover areas including uh, social services, uh, et cetera. Right. So for our uh, uh, professional diploma course, uh, it's targeted both as, uh, at healthcare professionals uh, as well as those in the social service sector and also those in the tech industry uh, providing uh, health or uh, well-being related uh, services and products. Okay. Uh, we have some questions coming in. Uh, maybe, uh, Brian, you can suggest, uh, choose. Sure. So one question from Kent is, uh, what software is available for us to map out a system? Okay. Uh, the, uh, actually, um, without having to uh, spend a lot of money, uh, we advocate, uh, in, in fact, uh, try not to use software initially when you're starting this thing. Uh, what we normally do in our courses is we will use the good old uh, post-it notes uh, because that allows for uh, learning through all your senses and uh, also the quicker uh, ab abil um, uh, ability to reorder your post-it notes to uh, uh, analyze the system and so on and, and to design the interventions. Right. But subsequently, you can go into uh, software. Uh, you can start off with just Visio. Uh, what we can't currently use is Miro. It's uh, ideal for the current COVID-19 situation where most of us have to work from home. Uh, so it's a, a team sharing whiteboard where you can do all this type of uh, uh, whiteboard activities like post-it notes, etc., uh, on the shared uh, device itself. Brian, any other questions? Maybe Brian, you can take the one on uh, design thinking and how it's related to all this. Um, so for that, I think that once we identify a certain uh, behavior, a mental model that's out there, from there, then we are able to understand these people a little bit better, um, develop some archetypes or personas around them. And from there, then we can then explore how might we design better services or solutions uh, in order to mitigate um, the situation on the ground. Uh, so, so I think that's where uh, design thinking can be applied after we have um, first understood the, end, the big picture. Yeah. So I think that's just one way that, that uh, design thinking can be put into play together with uh, system thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe I'll take this question. Uh, since you know human behaviors are unpredictable, how is systems thinking different from uh, scenario planning? Uh, I would say actually they are more or less the same. Essentially, it's just taking on that lens of systems thinking uh, in uh, planning out the scenarios because uh, I guess as what you have uh, guessed by now, um, you know we are affected by um, uh, many, many different uh, variables and even uh, 
uh, conditions and constraints. So there is a need to, you know, at least uh, take a step back and appreciate, you know, what is really affecting all of us in uh, in any scenario and then, you know, plan out what are the response plan from there accordingly. So, um, yeah, so I would say that actually systems thinking is quite integral in uh, planning out uh, scenarios. So we have a question here on the profit program. Uh, it asks, how long does it take to complete the Smart Health Profit? Um, we run two profit sessions every year. One that starts around March. Um, the five courses would end close to mid of the year in June, July. And then you'll start a capstone project after that. That, that is if you're coming in for a public program. Um, the second run starts about end of August, September, uh, runs at the end of the year, and you'll start your capstone project at the start of the next year. And that project also lasts for about six months to the middle of the year. So I guess uh, if you're coming in as um, a public, right, you are, it's in a stackable format. You can choose when you would like to take um, the five courses. And once you have completed the five, then you can then uh, proceed to your, your capstone to complete it in, in six months. Um, so yeah, it, it can take um, whenever that you're, you're available, uh, I would think, right, depending on your uh, availability of work. Um, for people who are interested in, in other forms of a program in terms of uh, professional conversion, say if you're coming in from a different industry and you would like to do transformation work within uh, the health uh, industry. Uh, for that, for the PCP program, um, entire program can, can be covered within six months. So. For example, the upcoming one starts in um, September uh, and you can take all five courses in a relatively small uh, period of time, one after another. Uh, and at the same time, do your capstone project and you'll be able to complete the entire course in, in six months. Of course, that the PCP has got different requirements. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later today at 1 p.m. So if you're interested, uh, do tune in later on. Okay, so if one question, maybe Brunel can take this. Okay, so now that we've identified the type of, you know, problem through the Canavering framework, you know, how do we actually go about solving them, these okay. problems? Uh, so as Lin Hui uh, presented earlier, uh, the first is to identify uh, the different elements of the problem you're having. Some may be simple, then that is quite straightforward to solve. Uh, the second complicated uh, so the first thing first is you have to understand that what you see as one problem may be actually different types of problem. And each type of problem, you must use the correct approach to solve it. Uh, so simple is usually very straightforward. Complicated uh, would need a process of analysis and usually you will need an expert in that particular domain area to help you with that analysis. So, um, um, so in, in the hospital, uh, in the normal healthcare setting, uh, when you need treatment for your illness, you go to a doctor. The doctor will then use a method of uh, doing hypothesis, uh, getting some data of uh, the symptoms that you have, uh, doing hypothesis of what, based on those symptoms, what could be wrong. Then from those hypotheses, they will know that, okay, if you have uh, COVID-19, uh, what do I need to what, if I think you have COVID-19, what are the additional data I need to have in order to confirm whether this hypothesis is true or not? So usually uh, complicated problems go by this method uh, of hypothesis and data and using the data to confirm which hypothesis is correct. And you need an expert in that domain area for it. Then when it comes to complex situation, as what Lin Hui say, uh, usually even if you're an expert, it may not help that much because a lot of the things are novel a lot of the things are non-deterministic. You cannot predict and guarantee that your analysis is correct, that your solution will work 100%. So a lot of it will then go into the agile cycle of probing, getting data, confirming whether things are working or not, and then pivoting to change uh, accordingly to something else that may work better, right? And then finally, in a chaotic situation, what we normally do is that uh, in a chaotic situation, people don't have the, set, the, the sense of mind to help solve any problem. They are all stunned by the chaos, uh, like uh, in some uh, emergency situations, some, uh, some countries were overwhelmed by the COVID-19 situation. The hospitals were full, were full. Uh, the mocks couldn't handle, uh, mortuaries couldn't handle the number of uh, deaths that were happening. Uh, so in that state, 
what you need is more to stabilize every people's, uh, everyone's mind so that then they can move on to concentrate on the problem. So in a chaotic situation, it's usually strong leadership, uh, uh, making assurance to people, gaining trust. And then once they have this, uh, then they have the sense of mind to look at the problem. And usually the problem would then become a complex or complicated problem and they will solve it accordingly. Okay, okay, so maybe I'll take one of the questions. Okay, uh, has any new project tech been done, you know, invented during the COVID-19 uh, uh, situation with systems thinking to improve care of patients or curb spread or uh, improve living hoods? Uh, I would say during this time, you probably realize that there's a lot of initiative that has gone on. Uh, whether or not it's uh, system thinking, it's not. I wouldn't say that it's very specific to you know system thinking uh, methodology. But I would say the thought process of coming out with these solutions, you know, uh, when, and whether is it you know uh, realized through technology or certain. Uh, uh, scenario planning, for example, uh, all these had some form of systems thinking uh, considerations in mind. So, so one example is perhaps, you know, in the social care space, we realized that, you know, once everyone is locked up at home, you know, with uh, safe distancing and whatnot, we realized that a lot of um, social problems starts to exhibit itself, whether it's through stress or through the fact that we are just isolated from each other. So um, I would say that uh, the you know, Agency of Integrated Care has more or less stepped up to you know, realize that there are all these different problems that are happening within uh, within the society, and then what they are trying to do is actually to link up different uh, social service agencies and to to more or less better deliver and then basically to connect all that and better deliver their services to the people who need them. So I would say that during this uh, the time, this is one example where it's uh, AIC actually um, you know think of. You know all the problems as some form of ecosystem, and then uh, and then carefully planning out. You know if I would, um, you know how if I were to deliver this, will I be affecting something else? Or if let's say you know for example, um, you know uh, elderly in the rental flats, for example, they have. Um, you know, they may have some form of social issue, which is one thing, but then, then again, their bread and butter, you know, of, you know, getting food every day might be an issue as well. So rather than to say that, you know, I, I have two, you know, agencies, um, you know, providing, you know, services for each of these problems, they actually think, they actually gone out of their ways to actually combine those services together and basically, you know, deliver those two services with only one touch point, for example. Yeah, and then other things would probably be, you know, through, um, you know, certain tech technologies that we have uncovered, such as, you know, Trace Together, for example. I mean, we know that, um, you know, people might not be uh, very um, compliant in reporting all their locations and uh, every every step and time. So, you know, part of their part of their, I guess, design thinking uh, met, uh, appreciation is that, you know, why not just design something that, you know, is able to do all this automatically. But then again, you know, it has to tie in with the rest of the infrastructure that is available in uh, at that point in time. So I would say, um, although, you know, these are tech solutions may be realized through, you know, technology, but, you know, the way that the design had, uh, went through some form of systems thinking considerations. Maybe I can, I can add to, to that. So uh, if you look at the, the latest one that has been put in place just last month, um, people that are coming in from overseas now have to wear a wearable when they're on stay home notice. Um, that actually clearly shows the appreciation of system thinking when it came up with that solution. Why? Because we know that we can't close our borders forever. We know that in order for the economy to stay vibrant in Singapore, we have to eventually open and start working with our neighboring countries and, and start the, the communications, right, with different places. People will have to come over to Singapore. So that is in, in effect, right, understanding the system entirely and how the, in order to protect the people in Singapore, you know, we have to run this wearable solution in order to better track them uh, and make sure that people are, are on stay-home notice stays at home. Uh, rather than, than going out there and you know, contributing to the cases in the community. Um, so they understood the system and therefore they then put it put this in place. Similar for, for both um, Trace Together and um, Safe Entry, right? So those two solutions do not directly impact the risk of uh, COVID, but they impact the number of community cases that are out there. Um, so again, it's the appreciation of this entire situation as a system. Uh, and coming from the perspective and coming up with these solutions. Yep. 
Okay. Uh, maybe Punam can take this question. Okay. Can a problem move from one canary category to another? Uh, yes. Uh, so, um, it can move from any category to any category. Uh, so, and the author of the Canafin framework itself says that the, even from simple, it can drop off into chaotic situation because uh, some problems seem simple, uh, but through neglect and so on, uh, things may fester underneath and it then uh, erupts and it becomes a chaotic situation. Uh, and then what may seem complicated initially uh, may also uh, turn out to be something new because uh, your initial virus, if it wasn't COVID-19 or was something else, the initial uh, virus could have been very straightforward to deal with as long as the doctor analyzed the symptoms, he can get some medication that would cure it. But viruses are part of a complex system, they evolve. So it could end up that particular virus evolve into something equivalent to COVID-19 and then it will move the situation from complicated into a complex situation. Right. So maybe I think now we only have time for one last question. Yeah, sure. Um, I choose one. Yep. Any software to identify positive people from long distance, like 30, 50 meters? Uh, <laughs> No, but I think we'll be talking more about um, digital solutions and transformation that we are seeing later at 2 p.m. So if you're interested in more of the digital solution uh, aspects of things and how digital transformation will be shaped uh, in, in the coming years, um, do stay tuned uh, and come to attend the session at 2 p.m. We'll talk more about uh, digital transformation with relations to COVID at that time. So I think that is almost all the time that we have. There's a QR code on the screen. Um, maybe you could take a scan at that and leave us some comments for the events today. Thank you so much for joining us. That's all the time we have for now. Thank you and see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>